Hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and final week of the Water for Food Global Forum hosted by the Doherty Water for Food Global Institute. I'm Dr. Michael Hayes, applied climatologist and professor in the School of Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and a DWFI faculty fellow. I also have the pleasure of serving as today's moderator for this session. This week, we're focused on climate change and extreme events. And in today's session, we will discuss the impact of extreme events on water, food systems, and human health. Today's session is the discussion portion of a two-part series on the same topic. Hopefully you had a chance to check out our speaker's presentations earlier this week in the on-demand section of the attendee website. However, if you didn't, it's no problem. I'd encourage you to view them after we're done here today. Today, you, the audience, We'll have the opportunity to ask panelists about the challenges we face and potential solutions for addressing food and water security and human health in the face of more frequent and intense extreme events. Throughout the session this morning or today, if you have any questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A box on the top right of your screen. We will try to address as many audience questions as possible during our one hour together. First, I'd like to introduce our expert panelists. Dr. Jesse Bell is the Claire M. Hubbard Professor of Water, Climate and Health in the Department of Environmental, Agricultural and Occupational Health at the University of Nebraska Medical Center and the School of Natural Resources within the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. He is also the director of the Water, Climate, and Health Program at UNMC and the director of Water, Climate, and Health at the University of Nebraska's Doherty Water for Food Global Institute. His expertise and research are focused on understanding the impacts of changes in the environment and climate on natural and human processes. Dr. Chris Funk is the director of the Climate Hazard Center at the University of California in Santa Barbara. He works with an international team of earth scientists to inform weather and famine related disaster responses. Chris studies climate and climate change while also developing improved data sets and monitoring prediction systems. Dr. Rachel McDonald is Deputy Director General Research for Development at the International Water Management Institute or EMI. She leads and drives the science agenda within EMI on water security to address global development challenges related to food, land, and water systems and to climate change. Mr. Andrew Odero is Regional Vulnerability Analysis and Mapping Advisor for the World Food Program. He coordinates and oversees food and nutrition security assessment and analysis for the Southern Africa region through a network of 30 food and nutrition security analysts. Andrew's mission is to develop a network of competent, confident, and highly professional analysts to drive the zero hunger agenda in Southern Africa. Mr. Mara Selman is Senior Officer for Water Security in Agriculture at the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, or FAO. He also leads the drought program in FAO. I have some questions to get us started, but I'd like to remind you again to put any questions you have in the Q&A box. I'm gonna start my questions in the order of the recorded on-demand video. So Dr. Bell, Jesse, you mentioned in your presentation populations of concern. Based on your research and experience, what will have the largest impact in relieving the negative effects of extreme weather from disproportionately affecting populations of concern. Thanks, Mike. That's that's a great question, and and you know I would say first off, the easiest answer to that is uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions, uh, so that in the future we don't have as ex our, our extreme events aren't more extreme and more frequent. Um, that's probably the simplest answer, but the more complex answer is is doing mitigation on uh, current extreme events within populations that we 
uh, that we work on or that we uh, engage with. You know, here in the United States, I said that uh, heat waves likely kill more people than any other climate or weather related event. Internationally, it's likely drought. Um, and both of those are unique threats and they both have unique ways that they respond. Heat waves is a little bit more direct human health response or human health outcomes where droughts have a little bit more of that indirect human health, delayed human health outcomes. Um, but both you can do in a kind of a similar fashion. It, it's really understanding your vulnerabilities, understanding your vulnerabilities within the populations that you serve, understanding the vulnerabilities uh, within the community as a whole. Um, and so some of this is just understanding your social determinants of health. Uh, and that's the makeup of the population, uh, looking at things like race, ethnicity, um, discrimination, uh, lack of access to care, you know, there's a variety of different factors that you need to, to understand within the population. Then next is understanding your actual threats. Um, the way that, for example, heat waves is one example, the way the heat wave uh, manifests here in Omaha and potentially uh, will cause human health outcomes is different than a heat wave in Paris or different than a heat wave in, let's say, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Like there are different thresholds because our bodies are used to and our systems around us are used to certain heat events. And so anytime that it exceeds that, that's when you can get potential human health outcomes. And that's the same thing with drought. You know, the way in the Western United States versus the Eastern United States, different parts of Africa, different parts of Europe, when drought manifests or any other extreme weather or climate event manifests, the outcomes can be different. And so we really need to understand the threats based on a local and regional level as well. And then I would say the last is understanding what are the current mitigation activities that are in place to reduce human health outcomes um, when these types of events occur and making sure that they're actually targeting the correct populations and uh, being uh, effective as possible. Because, you know, when we talk about climate change in particular, you know, we know that everybody is vulnerable to the health impacts associated with climate change, but certain populations are more at risk. And typically the ones that are more at risk are the ones that are, um, you know, low income communities uh, here in the United States is uh, communities of color, um, children and older adults. And so we need to make sure that we're understanding are the mitigations that are currently in place actually helping those populations that are uh, that need to be served the most. And then if they're not, how do we change those mitigation activities so that they're actually better targeting the populations that we're trying to serve as well? And so I say that's probably my, my best answer uh, and the shortest answer, uh, but I can do an entire symposium on that. I, I'm sure you can, Jesse. So thank, thanks, Jesse. Uh, my second question, uh, Mar Selmer, Selman. Uh, Mar, from your experience, what are some of the barriers that inhibit local communities from being prepared for droughts, the economic, social, political barriers? And, and is there a largest barrier that, uh, that you've seen in your experience? Thanks very much, Mike. It's my pleasure also to be in the panel. Actually, as concluded also by my presentation, um, we can tell that options, the technical ones, has, have been developed in order to prepare and respond to drought throughout the last decades. Um, and these options, we can also conclude that these options have been adapted to work in different con contexts. But what remains always the barriers actually is how to access this knowledge by community, how capacity that these communities have, how much capacity they have to carry out those identified actions, how much finance is available to make them. So these are the th three questions that not often answered despite that options are available. Adding to that, that we know always that the pace and severity of 
drought and prevent achieving the goals of res responding to it effectively. And that's why investing in preparedness, again, is key word here and it's essential. But to be more, let's say, transformative here, i.e. to change that threat of drought into opportunity and to change that disaster into success story, which is the goal now, what we aim all to achieve is to be more proactive, i.e. our continuous response should contribute to the long-term resilience of these communities. And in other words, we make a difference when we are more proactive, i.e. We, we are predicting, we are preparing, we are planning, and we are responding. So that's where I see the positive side answering your question at the end, while the barriers, as I mentioned earlier. Thank you, Mar. Um, and I was going to mention Mar is coming from Rome, so we have quite an international uh, representation on the panel today in terms of where our locations are. So the next uh, question I'm going to give to uh, Mr. Andrew Odero. So Andrew is in Namibia today. So welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, Andrew. Good afternoon. <laughs> Andrew, what are the greatest impacts uh, we will see over the next five to 10 years due to the increase of droughts in Southern Africa? And as you prepare your team, what are you telling them in terms of how do you prepare for these droughts in these next five to 10 years? Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, uh, what we have seen in, in Southern Africa region over the last um, six or seven years is a continued intensification of extreme events and particularly drought, which used to be uh, very localized, uh, becoming widespread uh, in, in the region. Uh, Southern Africa region has experienced some of the most uh, worst droughts in the last 40 years uh, since uh, in 2015, 2016. And what, what I have seen uh, from that time onwards is that, is that um, it, it, there has been a continuation of, of continu continuation of drought events uh, to such an extent that there are certain areas that have never uh, fully recovered from that initial drought. I have in mind um, South Madagascar, where from 2015, 2016, uh, we have seen a continued pattern of repeated drought events, which suggests to me that um, the, this drought e events are not going to go away. Uh, we need to prepare for them better. We need to have the right analytics. Uh, we need to have the right early warning tools uh, to ensure that we can address the impacts of, of, of drought. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in Southern Africa region is to, is to work with uh, the regional uh, intergovernmental body called known as Southern Africa uh, Development Community. And what we are doing through, through, through this uh, uh, body is to try and develop systems that will make us not, uh, not experience drought as a surprise. Of course, given the slow onset nature of drought, we see that uh, it always happens that it, we, we are always sort of caught by surprise when it shouldn't be the case, when we have the technologies, when we have a data that can give us advance warning upwards of, of uh, six to eight months even, uh, that we, we are likely to have a bad season. 
So, so we have been working progressively to develop tools that can help us anticipate the order of magnitude of the impact of drought from year to year that allow us, um, that allow us to be better prepared in terms of identifying which areas are affected. But also in Southern Africa region, it's not just drought. We are seeing an intensification of uh, tropical systems um, in, in, in the region. So it means that we are, not, we are not only caught up with drought, but we also caught up with uh, impacts of very strong uh, cyclonic activities, which we also need to anticipate and prepare for. So what I'm telling my, my, my analysts is that we've got to be prepared. We need to be able to generate data that can inform us when there is an impact of a sudden onset um, shock and, or when there is drought like where, like right now we have in South Madagascar and Southwestern Angola. Uh, we got to have systems that would allow governments to take corrective actions uh, long in advance before the real impact of drought happen. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that answer. Uh, next, Dr. Rachel McDonald. Uh, Rachel is in Rome today. So uh, Rachel, uh, in your presentation, you talked about governance, water governance. And I, I, I believe that the public has a big role in water government governance. So what can the general public do to advocate for more progressive and future focused water governance? Thank you, what a great question. It's a delight to be on the panel. So water governance is about the amount of water that's in a particular area, who owns it, who has the right to use it, how is it allocated, who controls it. And we know that in many of the areas we work, um, uh, agriculture, for example, has, a light, uh, uh, has rights to use it, people have rights to use it, the environment maybe have rights, industry has rights, commerce has rights. So that, for example, if you look at the back of Maha's um, screenshot, his back there, there's a reservoir there. And there's, a, there's water there. So who has the right? Do I have the right? Does Maha have the right? Does Jesse have the right? Or maybe Andrew and his farm has the right? Or what? So water governance is really critical because, because when the drought comes, we need a new set of rules that says, when there's only this much amount of water in the reservoir, these, are, these groups get preference and these do not have preference. And what we often see is that uh, people, uh, because of health, and Jesse would appreciate this, have preference. The human, ha we, we can't, we have no alternative. So often water is then taken away from other users like agriculture or maybe sometimes commerce. So that's water governance. So as a general public, um, if you're in an area and you're seeing how your uh, water is being married, managed, maybe it's not being managed well, uh, during drought, so you're not happy with it, find out, A, what, where does your water come from? What are the controls and what are the rights there? What are the laws? What are the common law? You know, there's sort of the various legal statutes for that water. The, and then who is the person? Who are the organizations that control that, who, uh, who make those decisions? And so as you begin to build up that picture, those are the people that you can talk to. So um, building up your awareness, of water and water resources, and then who controls it? What are those controls? Some of those co controls go back 250, 300, 1,000 years. So what is the, you know, the foundation of the allocation of that water? And in terms of future proofing, what we see in many countries is that um, the amount of water that, for example, I'm allowed is a fixed volume. I'm allowed so many acre feet of water a year. Well, that's fine for me, but maybe Chris is further down the stream and I've taken all the water because it's climate change, there's less water. He can't have it. So what we need to do is move much more towards a percentage base. For this year, whether there's a drought or whether there's not a drought, it might be a, a flood this year. Um, who can have and how can we share that equitably to reflect um, the needs of everybody who has needs from that that. Uh, whatever that body of water might be, the groundwater system or the surface water system, or maybe a combination of those. So that, Mike, is um, water governance and why it's critical in drought management. Thank you, Rachel. 
And then last but not least, uh, Dr. Chris Monk. Um, Chris is in uh, California this morning. So when it is this morning there. Uh, so Chris, in your presentation, you talked about stacking information. And so this question comes with that context. How can this drought prediction analyzing technology lead to productive change in local communities and national governments? Hey, thanks, Michael. Yeah, um, so I think I, I will explain soon about stacking, but I think even before you kind of get into the guts and the, and the, of the techniques, our conceptual framework for thinking about climate changes is, is really important to inform that. And you know, one of the things that's happening, which is great, is that there's a transition from kind of thinking about climate change as this you know, external process that just kind of warms everything slowly at the same time to thinking about climate change as, you know, as in terms of extremes. And if we focus on climate extremes, you know, so extremes that evolve slowly and create droughts, then, you know, the big player in that is, sea, especially for the tropics and subtropics, is, you know, sea surface temperatures. And something like 90% of the energy building up in the earth due to climate change is going into the oceans and then it moves around slowly. And those movements are creating predictable climate hazards. So, you know, uh, um, Andrew talked about the terrible 2015-16 drought, right? And so that drought was associated with a monster El Nino that was, you know, made worse due to climate change. And, you know, Andrew's busy preparing the, the Southern African development community you know, for the next big crisis. And, you know, I guarantee you that in the next five to 10 years, and I bet in the next five years, you're gonna see another event like that. Um, and then, you know, we also see uh, what are, so El Nino is associated with really warm water in the, in the Eastern Pacific and La Niñas are associated with cool waters there. But our research has also shown that um, when that's happening in recent, years, you have incredibly warm waters in the Western Pacific. And so, you know, this extra energy is moving around. And it turns out that those variations are predicted, you know, really well by climate models. And, you know, the, the climate community, you know, so basically the, the famines in the turn of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 19th century in India and China were associated with El Nino and kind of kicked off modern climate science. So we've been studying these events for a long time. They're handled well by models, but uh, there's a real gap is, you know, between um, the climate community's ability to predict these things and societal uptake. And so, you know, for example, uh, our group was able to predict the um, current drought in East Africa. This is October, November, December, short rainy season. We started predicting that in July of this year. And, you know, we're now predicting another drought for March, April, May, based on these La Nina-like sea surface temperatures. And uh, so that will likely result in four droughts in a year in, in Eastern East Africa. Uh, in, so four droughts in two years, but we can anticipate that. And uh, there's a potential to communicate that information. And so, uh, you know, moving on to the, the techniques, um, you know, my group is, is really heavily invested in integrated drought early warning systems. And the idea behind that is you have, you know, these very long lead forecasts that you can express as uh, you know, sets of analog years, which give you high resolution maps of precipitation, whatever variable you want. And then um, we can combine those with downscaled weather forecasts in the middle of the season, and then combine them with high resolution rainfall grids to have this kind of integrated system um, that lets us rapidly identify droughts, you know, either at very long leads if we have a skillful forecast or you know at the weather and kind of time scale as well. So you know the good news, at least in some places, 
is that we have some nice examples of that information being used to help communities and countries. So, um, you know, information from that system is, you know, being used to, to guide uh, activities of the Kenyan like National Drought Management Agency. Um, it's, you know, being used to uh, send out SMS messages to like hundreds of thousands of farmers in Kenya to guide you know, agriculture advisories. Um, it's being used by groups like the United Nations to pre-position humanitarian assistance in Ethiopia so that when the rains failed this year, uh, you know, kids could still go to school and uh, you could get people, you know, who were showing medical impacts of malnutrition, you know, to um, health clinics. So there's good stuff happening, but we need to scale up and, and do a lot more. Thanks, Chris. Um, and thanks to everyone for those questions. Again, it, from the audience, if you have questions, just uh, send them through the Q&A box. I had a couple of group questions. So anybody can answer these questions or you can all answer these questions. But uh, my first question is, um, I, I, I think you all are heroes out there with the work that you're doing. So you all deserve to be on Time Magazine's Person of the Year cover um, for the work that you do. So I really appreciate everything that you do. If, if there was a high school student out there or a secondary education student out there who wanted to do what you all do and help the societies that you all help, what would you recommend they go in and study as they go pursue their career or you know what, where, what direction would you have some of these youth take if they're interested in following in your footstep, footsteps and helping uh, society out there going forward? So I open that up to any or all of you. Um, who would like to uh, go first? All right, Rachel, you can go first. Well, I'm being highly biased here, and Mike, I think you'd understand it. I'm a geographer. So I study not only Clyde, hey, it's and Chris as well. So I study uh, and, and did uh, study what goes on in the environment, climate, water, whatever it is. But I also um, study people and, what, uh, and also power and politics and political. There are many, many stems of geography. And I just found that unless I had those two bits, it's like your left side, right side of your brain coming together. Unless you've got that coming together, um, you can't understand many of the complexities that go, um, because what we're seeing are highly complex challenges. So we've got the sea surface temperatures that Chris is talking about, but we've also got development challenges and many of the uh, issues that the FAO deals with might have an environmental base, but there's, you know, there's a social and environmental issues around those as well. So I think having that geographical left side, right side brain is very useful. Thanks, Rachel. Who else would like to answer that question? I, I can take a stab at it. <clears throat> right, I, you know, first and then Andrew. Yep. Yeah. The, the I you know I, I think that's a wonderful uh, answer that Rachel gave. Um, so I don't know how much I can actually add to it, but you know I, I whenever I've talked to younger people about this, uh, you know, there's there this is such a complex problem and it requires multi disciplinary approach. And so we need a lot of expertise as well. And so I think there's whatever your passion is, whatever your interest is, you know, say it's writing, say it's policy, say it's all these other things. Um, there's still opportunity to move forward and, and work on this in some capacity and bring your unique expertise into this. And, you know, sometimes when you're, you're working in you know, you, especially when you're first getting your first job, one of the things I always tell people, especially from here that graduate with a master's of public health, I'm like, you know, you're, you're going into the field. It might not necessarily be in the exact thing that you're interested in, but part of it is if you have this interest, you can pull that in in some capacity and try to make that part of your work. There's always, no, there's not always, but a lot of times there's some flexibility in, in any job that you have. And so bringing in some of that expertise is, uh, or some of that interest can potentially uh, rearrange your career. I know it happened with me. That's kind of how I got started. I became interested in some of these topic areas 
And it was just through good luck and pure will of, of spirit at times to actually kind of transition my career and, and focus more in this, this area. So that, that's my, I guess that's my two cents. That's great, Jesse. Andrew, you, you indicated an interest in this question. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I trained as a, as, a, as a farmer. I wanted to be an agronomist, helping farmers with sound advice um, uh, to improve their production. But as, as um, my career evolved, I see, I saw a, a, an increase, a common pattern affecting farmers all around, uh, not only in Kenya where I grew up and studied, but I, I, I saw a commonality of issues, recurrent issues that affect uh, farmers in, in, in different ways and smallholders in different ways. And um, so, so my contribution and my advice is that uh, if, if uh, you have the passion to address some of the problems, the multidimensional complex problems around you, there's always an entry point regardless of which field you're coming in, there would always be an entry point fueled by, by your passion. So, so at, at this point, because of the complexity of the issues, uh, it's difficult to prescribe that this is an entry point. Although uh, looking at uh, the representation of geography in, in, this, in this call, I, I think that uh, that's an obvious, obvious uh, good choice and entry that allows for a very, very uh, open uh, engagement. Other fields like human ecology in anthropology would, would, would be, would also be good ones. And uh, I have seen people who started off completely in art and, uh, uh, and architecture and engineering who find their way into, into the work that we do. So I think passion is extremely important in defining how 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 you enter into into this space? Thank you. Yeah, I love that response, uh, Mar. You had your hand raised. Thanks very much for that. Actually, I build on justice. Actually, if I am to advise a, a a young professional, I mean from practice, I would say be close to communities. Those are the communities affected by by these let's say hazards. Then see their local knowledge. Because no matter what we build in science or institutions, internationals, I mean, it has to start with that local or from that local knowledge and upgrade it and integrate it, then can be later, if I talk technically, can be later accepted by those. So be close to community, be close to field. And then our response in that case would be successful because they would accept it. Better. Good point. Chris, anything you want to add to that? Or? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I, I do like the idea of following your passion. And, you know, uh, I mean, it's great to, to be knowledgeable and interested in, in helping people, but we have to become knowledgeable first. And so, I mean, for me, my personal path led from a background in the humanities as an undergraduate to geography, to, you know, a, a, a passion for climate. And, and, and that passion, you know, it, it, you know it, I use it now to help people, but, you know, I was drawn by, I love to look at maps of rainfall and I love to understand the processes involved and to think, you know, so, you know, follow what you love and then use that information to help other people. And uh, you can always come to Santa Barbara Geography Department if you want to do that. Thanks, Chris. I wish I was still a student. I'd definitely be looking into that. <laughs> so, hey, hey, Chris, I'm going to follow up with another question to you. So one of the questions we received from the audience was, um, it, the question is, how much advance warning in terms of months, weeks, or days is needed for farmers and policymakers to take corrective measures and so the the question goes on chris you say you have nice ways what are these 
is the question. We'll start with you. And if someone wants to respond to that after you go, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think there's basically uh, kind of three time scales, right? There's uh, the climate prediction time scale on the order of maybe one to, to eight months. There's a weather time scale of maybe one to two weeks. And then there's the observational time scale, which is maybe, you know, the last month or so, something like that. And, you know, uh, we can provide, you know, effective uh, information on all of those time scales. And, you know, that can be used in, in different ways. You know, it, for example, uh, uh, you know, Andrew Darrow talked about preparedness in Southern Africa. Well, we're working with our common friend Tumuka Magadazire and talking to the Med Agency in Zimbabwe and showing them that there's really good predictability uh, at seasonal time scales. And that could be used uh, not just to anticipate bad season, but to anticipate good seasons when farmers can plant crops that take more time to mature, but are higher yielding, things like that. Um, and then at the weather time scale, you know, there are decisions about when to apply fertilizer, you know, when to plant, um, you know, that kind of question. And then finally, you know, when you get into the, the monitoring time scale, at least for, you know, uh, mitigation activities, you know, that's, if, if you can observe a drought, so we can observe, uh, you know, the drought over Southern Angola, you know, right, you know, with very limited latency and, and high degree of accuracy. And, you know, those water deficits uh, at mid season, you know, are gonna be a very good leading indicator of, you know, poor harvests and then hunger almost 12 years, 12 months later when you get into the next lean season. So all of these sources of information can be used um, effectively. But, but are they? <laughs> right. Does anybody want to add something to Chris's response? All right. All right. I'll, I'll um, ask another question. Um, any of you can, can answer this question. How do we use all this early warning data to inform policy and instigate change? Are there specific examples of success stories of policymakers and researchers working together to prevent impacts of extreme events? I'm sure you all might have some success stories to share, but uh, yeah, if a couple of you want would like to take that question, that would be great. Um, any volunteers? I, oh, sorry, Chris. I, I didn't mean. Oh no, go ahead. Oh go, no, go ahead. I was just... Yeah, you know, and I, I was going to add actually to the previous comment as well that that Chris had, which is, you know, from a public health perspective, all information is good information. The the better the early warnings, the more that you can take that information and actually use it for action. Now. That's all great information, but figuring out how to actually translate that into something that's useful for, for different communities and different populations is, is also really important because we can have the best early warning system, but let's just say from a public health perspective, if, if we don't know what that actually means, that's where it, it dies on the vine. And so how do we make it so that it actually can uh, get to the populations that are most needing of the information and the policymakers and decision makers actually understand the information. And that's one of the things that we've been working on is, uh, especially with drought here in the United States, we've been meeting with uh, public health professionals around the country to try to better understand how are they engaging in drought? Is this a concern for them? What are the threats that they're facing? What are the threats and what are their concerns coming from drought? And one of the big things that comes out of it is they don't know how to use the information that's provided. And there's a lot of information out there and they don't really know what that means to them when they're trying to work with their population. So how do we better translate that information and work with those populations to make sure that that is translated? And so if I had to say that there was a success story, well, we haven't got there yet, but that is one of the success stories I'm hoping we're getting to is figuring out how that we can take this information that we're providing from a climatological, meteorological perspective so that it's more translatable to public health professionals so that it can move on. 
And there are examples of that. And extreme heat is definitely one of those examples. Um, we are improving our early warning systems around extreme heat. And that has been partially through engaged efforts with public health, healthcare, uh, meteorology, climatology, and all these other entities coming together to try to improve systems. And we see it here in the United States and we're seeing it internationally as well. We're not to the level that we need to be, uh, but we're still, we're moving closer to that. And, it, it's not, and we realize also it's not a one size fit all for all these different populations. So that's, those are my two, two cents. Thanks, Jesse. Chris, you were gonna add something or respond and then we'll go to Mark. Sure, yeah, just, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be quick. So, you know, the level of global food insecurity since 2015 has is almost doubled. So there's, you know, from about 45 million extremely food insecure people to about 92 million now. And, you know, you can think about that as, uh, in a way, a success in the sense that uh, our food security monitoring systems are, you know, managing to safeguard, you know, almost 100 million lives. And, you know, examples, you know, might be like uh, prevention of like, the type of famine that we saw in Somalia in 2011. And so, you know, we're effectively doing that. Um, but then again, you might also, you know, so we're effectively using climate information to you know, inform food security, but I would say that we're also failing to use that information proactively to really safeguard livelihoods, which is a, a much harder problem. Over. Thanks, Chris. Mar, you had your hand up and then Rachel. Well, I mean, the early warning, that's what we see always critical. And one of the main, perhaps, or the, 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 the important important usefulness of that is the, 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 the issue of declaring drought. So, so if I have sufficient data as early warning, then, then that would help us policymakers to declare drought situation, meaning departure from normal operation to, 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 to emergency, for example, and then it would help also how I, I classify the levels of drought and then how I systematize my response to drought in that case. So it, it, it could be seen as such as a, as a first, let's say, benefit that we, we, we get from. Now examples, systems are many nowadays. Examples are in many places successful. Uh, from from international organizations work, but I would see that that is the first to come in mind when when we talk about early warning and and the usefulness of it and its data. Thank you, Mar. Um, Rachel. Hi, thanks. Great question and superb set of answers. So just to add a little bit other to this. So uh, when one of the things we can do with drought monitoring of, of current conditions is link it to payments to farmers or those that are impacted by the drought. And we do this in, for both droughts and floods in, in various areas. Um, what there is an experimentation of, and it's about future payments, forward paying. So Chris's uh, monitoring can show that there's going to be this uh, drought in four months time affecting East Africa. And what we can do is there can be payments to those areas that are identified to give flood, uh, to, to experience that drought. So those farmers receive payments before the drought actually happens. This is all highly experimental. There's been some, it's all linked to artificial intelligence. There's bits and pieces like that, because as a farmer, maybe if I receive some cash, I would then be able to move or I would be able to take actions that means when the drought comes, I am not so impacted. I might be able to buy food. I might move my family to the um, to the a city or where I can earn money that way. So it's all about offsetting. But this is very experimental because, as an insurance company or as a government, you want to you usually want to pay out what's what's happened now. You've got proof of it. So I might pay some people in advance, and the, the drought doesn't come, or I don't pay some people in advance, and the drought comes and hits that area. So it, it's an interesting research area that various organizations are looking at 
uh, that, that begins to answer some of that question as well in a different way. Thanks, Rachel. And Andrew, I'm going to call you out for a response too, because I, I'm i really interested in the situation in, in Madagascar right now that you had brought up. And do you see um, any success stories coming out of that situation or maybe what's in Southern Angola based on your work? Or, or if you look ahead, what kind of lessons learned might there be uh, that you could then apply elsewhere from that situation in, in Madagascar? Thank you, Michael. The situation in South Madagascar is, uh, is, a, is a very desperate one, which comes out of um, years and years of uh, con continuous bombardment of drought uh, against uh, a context that is very uh, under-resourced in terms of development, in terms of uh, basic infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what, what I would consider as a success is that after much, much uh, uh, engagement with partners and government, there is finally an acknowledgement in South Madagascar that uh, this situation cannot be, con cannot be let to go on, that you know, the, the underdevelopment was sort of conflating the impacts of drought and uh, and people would always say that, uh, but this is uh, a development issue. So, uh, so what I'm what I'm seeing in South Madagascar is finally an acknowledgement that um, we really need to invest in livelihood building. Uh, we need to really work closely with the government to uh, inspire uh, developments in. In, uh, to inspire development in South Madagascar, if we are going to deal with uh, with the impacts of drought, uh, which will continue to be a norm. So there's that final, that, uh, that acknowledgement that drought is with us, we need to change the approach. And for me, I consider that a success, even though it hasn't yet translated to, into definite programs. At the World Food Program, uh, we are, um, working on community resilience uh, building projects. And uh, we would like to see how, uh, what bundle of uh, intervention uh, centered around provision of water because water is one of the, the key constraints. So we, we're trying to center our uh, using, use water provision as the organizing principle uh, upon which we, we try to extend and diversify the support that we provide. Now, for South, for South Angola, um, uh, the, the success that I see is the government realizing that, uh, that this advanced work that you do uh, uh, as early as January, February in the year could actually help in identifying areas which are of concern. And uh, of late in the last, uh, couple of months, uh, actually weeks, actually, the, the government has actually used some of this information to set up a, a task team to address this issue uh, of drought, not just for now, uh, but the, the government is tasking this uh, high level committee to help in identifying long lasting solutions. And uh, Rachel talked about um, feature proofing. Uh, that's what, where I see we are heading, whereby the, there's a constant recognition that drought is impact, impacting different sectors of, of the economy. And therefore we have to find, uh, think about drought in all our programs, programs and make provisions for them in, in the overall development planning. So again, um, there is some very, very good success, uh, which I hope would lead to future fruitful outcomes. Thank you. Andrew, thanks for those stories from Madagascar and Angola. I think they're very informative for this panel. So thank you very much for that. So um, lots of questions to choose from. 
I'm going to choose this question because I think it gets back to our combination of climate, weather, food, and health. And so the question is um, comes from a, a somebody. I was wondering if the panelists can speak to the occupational exposures hazards that food producers are facing with a changing climate, particularly in the context of balancing food demand and health protection. So that's the question. Anyone like to uh, volunteer to go first for that? I, I can take a crack at it. Um, Thanks, Jesse. That's, that's a good one. Um, and when we were talking about, especially food producers and, and the additional challenges that they face, like, and it really comes from a variety of different angles. So everything from the worker on the ground and the increase in uh, extreme heat that they're potentially being exposed to, or even potentially chemicals that they're being exposed to as you know, new threats pop up and we need more pesticide use and all this other stuff. And so just the, the general exposure to the farmer themselves um, and living in a more variable, uncertain environment puts potential stress and strain on them, both economically and, and mentally. And so there's a variety of different potential exposures there. And, and it's really hard to isolate which one is, is potentially causing, could potentially cause more harm. I think all of them simultaneously are, are, are of major threats. And so we need to better understand all of these threats so that we can try to help mitigate and reduce impacts. Um, yeah, was there another part to that question, Mike? I'm trying to remember in particular. I was trying to find it on the... Yeah, so it really got into like the food producers too, kind of at that very local scale. So, um, you know, are there, are there particular hazards that these folks are facing, maybe related in your case to health and, and some of the changes and heat waves and that type of thing? I'll pass it over to Chris. <laughs> uh, oh yeah I mean, well i can just uh you know um you know some of uh, our colleagues like Catherine grace and, and frank davenport you know have done work um relating you know specific health risks in africa to to drought to extreme temperatures and, and rainfall deficits and you know their work has has found that you know really strong links to low birth weight pregnancies which are a real long-term health risk and also, you know, childhood stunting. And, you know, in, in, in kind of numerous studies, they've shown that, that you know, really warm temperatures and, and rainfall deficits, you know, are basically as important as other like, you know, key indicators like whether, you know, the mother went to high school or whether your house, you know, has flooring, which is an indicator of wealth. So it's like a first order impact that is, you know, having you know, big impacts. And then, of course, there's also lots of research linking you know, increased, you know, heat to re reduce worker productivity because it just gets too hot to work. Um, so it, it definitely is, there are a lot of impacts that are already happening now. Over. Great, thanks, uh, Chris. Uh, Mar. Yes, actually, to, 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 the, to, to, to the same direction, actually, entry points to mitigate the risk of droughts are sectorals. So, so we, we talk about water and sanitation, but also we talk about agriculture. It's obvious that when we have a lack of rainfall and when we have a, a, a reduced supply of water, for irrigation, thus, as Chris said, mentioned the productivity. So, so we are we are we are we have decreased productivity. Thus, we have affected crop producers by this fact. And then not only crop producers here, but also we can come to that to, to that to that livestock sector also, which is a, a, a food producer here. So so this is critical, and that would require actually measures to, to respond to and to mitigate the risk of drought. And essentially, those measures would deal with storing and, and conserving water 
uh, and feed supplies, etc. So this is a very, very direct connection between the two that, that, that's obviously affecting the agriculture sector from food production, um, crop producer, and also um, livestock plant. Unmuted. So sorry about that. Ha that has to happen once in every uh, webinar, right? So uh, thank you, Maher. Rachel, you had your hand up. And thank you for taking one for the team there, Mike. Uh, we're, all, we're all immune now. Uh, so one of the things that we have seen in some of the work that we do, particularly in the Middle East, North Africa, as droughts come along, there is a drop off in, in uh, food production, 40% drop in the yield or livestock, as Maher's talking about, and things like that. And what we often see is Younger, often male people, male members of the family will move to the cities, will earn money, driving taxis or whatever it might be, to ensure that that food, that, you know, the family is still able to buy food, still receive food. And uh, we can see, uh, it's something Jesse talked to, it's not, not everybody is uh, impacted equally. So young and old, um, male, female, but you can see all sorts of differences. And you know, we're seeing in many uh, countries this feminization of agriculture. So there are more women who are left behind, who are, have their, they, they take care of the families, but they're also doing the, the work of the farming as well. So that they, you know, there's quite a, a physical and mental stress there. But what we often see with uh, particularly the young men, but, but men who have left the family, they go to cities, um, and yes, they're earning money there, but but there's a loss of honor, there's loss of family, there's loss of prestige where they come from, and they tend to live in you know quite poor. They're, they're saving money, they're living in very poor conditions. So there's all sorts of mental and also physical challenges with that as well. So this is sort of it, when there's displacement, where there's some sort of movement to offset the impacts of droughts. Um, we can see it plays out in many different ways. That you know, as we're dealing, helping, trying to develop mitigation. Some of those ideas that uh, both Andrew and Mahad, but we need to look at what this intersectionality of different uh, population, members of the population. Thanks, Rachel. Unfortunately, we're rapidly running low on time, but there is one question that came in and maybe one of you can address this. Um, so a lot of the discussion has been around drought, but I assume flood, and uh, flood mitigation, flood management, there are very similar issues related to what you all have been discussing. Does anyone want to just kind of address how flood fits in with all of these discussions? Anyone? Go ahead, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. This is a very appropriate question for Southern Africa, we know that Southern Africa is largely uh, prone to, to droughts, but occasionally we have, you know, these uh, episodic events that uh, bring a lot of drought. Uh, I'll give an example. Last year, um, in the last season, we had a forecast of a La Nina, which generally brings favorable uh, news to our region in terms of production. Nonetheless, we saw this uh, devastating impacts of drought in, um, in, in South Angola, South Madagascar, et cetera. Now, but we also had uh, a lot of cyclonic activities as well, which caused local, uh, not as damaging uh, impacts like we had with Cyclone Idai, which was a category or category four, five almost. Um, and what we are seeing um, is that you know, anticipating and preparing for flood is even more difficult than drought. And, and we have started with uh, the current forecast of La Nina for Southern Africa to ensure that we have all our data, all our mapping of all the areas that uh, potentially could be affected by floods already mapped out and pre-assessed flood risks, et cetera, et cetera, because Often when floods happen, it's too late to take uh, uh, mitigative action. So, so for floods, we really need even more an advanced preparedness. And in many cases, a no regret preparedness uh, approach is, uh, is, is preferred in the case of drought, because when it happens, it's really bad. 
If it doesn't happen, you're better off. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew, for that response. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. So I'd really like to thank our panelists for their participation in this important conversation and our audience today for your thoughtful questions. And just to the panelists, you guys are heroes. I wanna thank you for all the work that you do out there. It's so valuable and so important. So uh, thank you very much and uh, have a good rest of the day.